Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. And today we'll be creating another gallery page but one with a slight difference. Before we've been looking at more conventional photo layout so we're adding the text to our front page first then adding a new page relatively easily done selecting the pictures section and choosing the larger pictures here so just get rid of those upload the new pictures just like that and these are actually colorized glass slides. So unlike your normal picture, they are not landscape, they are square. So we have to go in and find an option for that. And there is indeed a one-to-one -one square. So obviously I've cropped out already in image processing at the edges of the glass slide, but this is a set of eight glass slides from the 1900s, which is all to do with HMS Dreadnought. You might recognize some of the pictures as they have taken those as a baseline and then colorized them for these contemporary glass slides, which can be shown on projectors. Then it's quite easy to pop back into the front page, add a link to the newly created page. And now there's a fresh gallery with some glass slide scans. And I might add to that later on. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakenafel. You can get a free trial, and once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and on with the main show. Back in June 2022, I was lucky enough to go and visit Canada for a few weeks, and met up with some Canadian subscribers, and looked at various elements of Canadian naval history. You've already seen videos I've done on HMCS Sackville and HMCS Haida, but I'm going to bring you another video from Canada today. This is the Canadian Naval Museum in Halifax, or otherwise known as the Naval Museum of Halifax, which is found in the North End District, actually on the naval base within Halifax, and I'll explain a bit more in the video itself. So this is a slightly different style of video because there was somewhat limited time and also back in June 2022 Canada was still under a reasonable amount of restrictions with regards to Covid. I filmed it as basically a walking tour. So hopefully you'll enjoy this and if you do find yourself in Halifax in Canada I do encourage you to have a much more detailed look at the museum. Nonetheless. So hello everyone, uh, you join me in the Naval Museum of Halifax. This is actually on the naval base in Halifax, but don't worry. Um, although regulations at the moment are a little bit more restrictive, once some of those regulations are lifted, you can actually access this museum by showing an appropriate form of photo ID at the entrance and telling them you're coming to the museum. So keep an eye on their website for when that's possible. and you can come and enjoy this place as well, and I thoroughly recommend it. Now, let's go on a little tour, shall we? So here's your entrance with many of the ship's badges from various ships in the Royal Canadian Navy. You can see there are a few missing, so if anybody happens to know where the ship's badge for HMCS Frederick Roulette, William Hall, or Robert Hampton Gray happens to be, then I'm sure they'd be very, very grateful to hear about it and uh, let people know where they are and so they can be included on here. Also, I think Margaret Brooke and Max Bernays are represented only by paper. So, uh, so is Lloyd George. So those are the ones you want to keep an eye out for. They do show up in the weirdest places. There's a bell. There is a, <laughs> a distinct temptation to ring it, but uh, I shall not, for there are many bells, uh, which you'll see. Apologies for the uh, creaking wood, but it is a very old house. Survived mostly the Halifax explosion, amongst other things. And that's uh, Bonaventure's battle board. Now, this is on the ground floor. There are three floors open, uh, ground floor, first floor and basement. And this room as a model of a ship which you will become very familiar with when <laughs> wandering around. And uh, this of course is a flower class corvette. Uh, this particular one is the Rivière du Loup, I think. My French is as usually terrible. 
but there will be others and you've got various artifacts this place is absolutely full of artifacts it's wonderful also if you happen to want to be doing research this is probably the best room for you to be in because as well as the models as you can see there are cases and cases and cases of various things you've got u.s navy institute proceedings over there um here is a model of the i believe it's aristigouche again uh can't really say i'm too familiar with the pronunciation and more artwork there's loads of fantastic artwork and they're working on displaying more and more of it as well as digitizing an extensive photo collection so you've got the naval review or some of it at least another bell please do not touch it says okay i will respect that um more interesting books and then of course if you have any family in the canadian navy there is the canadian navy list in its many 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 iterations the hmcs niagara which is of course an ex-us four stacker destroyer from the second world war built just after the first world war and served in the second world war and for those of you who really like ships models there are many many detailed ships models frigates um, supply vessels destroyers yet another uh, this is a frigate uh, not a corvette and hmcs hyder herself in her wartime scheme and you can tell that compared to how she is these days because of course she's got her two twin mounts forward she doesn't have the rail system that she has now and then right aft you've got the twin 4 inch AA and then her 4.7 inch aft as well some of the other stuff they're working on and yet more various bits that are useful for research so we've got the mariner's mirror here in green canadian forces sentinel here in blue journals of navigation various royal canadian navy um, publications and then some more personal and slightly older publications letters of condolence from uh, king george during the world wars merchant navy histories official histories and so forth so definitely a place to come if you have some research to do there's another room with models where the staff are currently working um, so we won't disturb them down here but it's also definitely worth a look and then we are going to head upstairs first and then we'll head down into the basement as well so this is again some of the artwork that i was mentioning earlier uh, again a lot of this has been in storage for a very long time hmcs uganda there in the pacific but a lot of it is now as i said coming out of storage and being properly displayed you'll see more of some of this as we go on and this is some really fantastic naval art and unsurprisingly flower class corvettes <laughs> are a fairly common theme as are river class frigates and so forth and that brings us up the stairs to the top floor now this has quite a number of different rooms and they're all themed after different things as well as again more artwork on display and as far as artwork and photos go they are working to digitize as much of it as possible but trust me from doing my own work on my own collection it takes time so time wise starting off here in the age of sale room this you might think looks a little bit more like an old school museum and it is there's a french 74 gun model there absolutely beautiful and the idea of this is that it is laid out a little bit old in an older style where you'd need a tour guide to basically tell you what there's what's around can't wait for someone to digitize all of these wonderful color engraving etchings of 19th century ironclads 
and the museum is gradually being overhauled on a room by room basis to bring it a bit more up to date but you'll be very glad to hear there's no kidification going on it is purely a matter of adding more explanationary um, and more notes so that people can look at things themselves so it's a depiction of the battle of trafalgar for example so <laughs> oh look yet another thing that you could ring very loudly and another sign that says please don't um, and some of these other color engravings and posters etc that you see around so very definitely worth coming to see that i'm deliberately not showing you too many things in detail because of course the idea is for you to come and see it yourself uh, not for me to basically mean let you allow you to stay at home completely there's enough detail for those of you who can't can't make it perhaps but it's very definitely worth coming and seeing yourself if you can now this room is a little bit um i wouldn't say macabre because that's not really the point but it is something that gives you a bit of a pause to think now obviously the museum of the atlantic down on the shoreline also has a section on the halifax explosion this is a separate section there's bits of the house here that survived the Halifax explosion the house itself overall did but there were casualties get an idea of how close to the explosion they were you can see there's the site of the explosion we are less uh, less than a mile away just a fraction over half a mile away so the fact that this building remained mostly standing is a bit of a credit to her builders who of course built this house they were a bunch of uh, sailors and dockyard workers they built this house's wooden frames in much the same way they build a ship which is probably a good chunk of the reason why it was still mostly intact and you can see from some of these photos there was a lot of stuff nearby that really was not shortly thereafter um, here's HMCS Niobe looking a little the worse for wear after that explosion and that's something we'll cover a bit more as we move on our way around and this they're still finding things so these are bits that were blown over the side of Niobe they were only f discovered in the past five or six years during dredging operations and you have other pieces so this is these are fragments of the Mont Blanc the ship that exploded and it is a little bit chilling because some of this stuff is fairly thick steel and as you can see this would have either been flat or regularly curved very definitely isn't anymore um, that was just twisted up like pretzels and chucked through the, through the air to be found later on um, yeah this thing not a question mark not a walking stick that used to be an anchor chain believe it or not um, an anchor chain link being completely opened up by the uh, explosion so if you want to do research into the Halifax explosion this is kind of the other half of the equation when you're in Halifax so we then come round into here and this is why I said HMCS Niobe you get a bit more information as we go on because this room might as well be called the HMCS Niobe room which was the first flagship of the Royal Canadian Navy in initially the rather superb Victorian Navy peacetime colour scheme and then latterly in a slightly more boring grey but they have loads of photos of life aboard the ship uh, and lots of artefacts so there's a foot pump organ various bits of the ship's silver service navigation tools apologies for the beeping there's not a lot i can do about that right now <laughs> um, the original ship's bell back when she was hms niobe and a rather wonderful model there are a lot of rather wonderful models around here so each of these rooms is of course relatively small because this is not a purpose-built museum this is of course somebody's house that's been turned into a museum but it does actually compartmentalize off everything quite nicely as well so here we find ourselves in a room that has been somewhat more recently updated as you might guess by the large number of information boards 
And this room, uh, appropriately themed in blue, and actually legitimately also feels cooler, <laughs> is all about Canada's relationship with the Arctic. So those of you familiar with Canadian naval law will recognize HMCS Labrador here and uh, the rather unique bow shape that allows her to break through the ice. But yeah, this covers all sorts of information about how the Royal Canadian Navy has explored the Arctic and how it's safeguarding Canada's interests these days in the Arctic. Of course, <laughs> the vast majority of it's to do with uh, the Northwest, Northwest Passage, the Franklin Expedition and so forth. And uh, well, that didn't end particularly well for anyone involved. So they're doing a bit better these days. And then we get to the uniform room. So we have various uniforms all across time. All the way from, you know, when Canada existed but wasn't a specific country, all the way through to the And then we come through here into what's effectively the First World War room. Bearing in mind the Royal Canadian Navy was fairly small and quite new at the time of the outbreak of the First World War. And yet they stepped up to the plate in a big way. So you've got various accounts of occurrences obviously the lusitania are very prominent amongst them but also records of the numerous small canadian navy vessels that were either built or brought into service letters home in great embroidery posters models pictures medallions medals swords always good and examples of you know, the service records of personnel and the camouflage schemes of the ships they sailed on. So this is what Titanic ship, sister ship Olympic looked like in her career as a troop ship in the First World War. Some explanation as to where these colors came about from. And then the last room up here is what effectively you might call the World War II room and more specifically for the most part you might call the Battle of the Atlantic room because although obviously the Royal Canadian Navy did serve in pretty much every theatre of the war their primary contribution was escorting convoys in the Caribbean and in the Atlantic and therefore unsurprisingly there are many models of flower class corvettes um, of different ages, different sizes, different color schemes, and of course, destroyer that fought a U-boat. And uh, originally, as with many Royal Canadian Navy ships, originally a Royal Navy ship. And uh, well, a slightly edited somewhat more family friendly version of Oakville's boarding of German submarine in the Caribbean. See my video on the Royal Canadian Navy, uh, the history of the Royal Canadian Navy for the uh, slightly more <laughs> historically accurate version of that event. But we mentioned the destroyer that fought against a U-boat and they actually have both an account here, thinking of U-210, but also a photo album which was actually taken by one of the crew of the destroyer and details all the damage that they suffered in the aftermath, well, during the battle, and then these photos are taken in the aftermath. Definitely worth having a look at, um, especially once it's been digitized or if you get research access and they're happy to let you have a look yourself. Then you've got bits about how you survive at sea. Obviously the sinking of HMS Athabascan one of Canada's tribal class destroyers. And uh, this one is Shediac, another flower class Corvette. And interestingly, for those of you who like the history of these kinds of things, if you're wondering, that's where the uh, Aztec Dome was. So when you hear about some of the actions of Royal Canadian Navy ships that are 
lose their ASDIC domes to ramming enemy vessels, that's where it is, and that's not a thing you see very often on models of the flower class. But there's also some information about various German prisoners and so forth. This is apparently a model of Bismarck that one of the survivors of Bismarck made while he was interned in Canada, although given that in this model Bismarck has three triple turrets instead of uh, four twins, uh, one has to charitably believe perhaps he was part of the engineering crew or something and hadn't actually had much chance to pay attention to what Bismarck actually looked like. But there you go. Such is the varieties of war. So that concludes our brief look at what's up here. And we can now then head downstairs, uh, down this set of stairs, because that gives me the opportunity to show you even more photos, the various frigates and corvettes of the Royal Canadian Navy. And a very nice extensive collection of cap tallies. More artwork. And a figurehead, quite literally. Coming back down past the stairs that we came up. And down to the lower level, it's nice and cool here. Uh, we have HMS, HMCS Cornwallis, HMCS Halifax, various other battle boards, but we also have this thing. Now, you might immediately think, yes, Drac, that's a torpedo, very nice. What's so important about this one? Well, this isn't just any torpedo, no, before anyone asks, it's not a Mark 14 either. Give you some idea how old it is. Take a look at how faded and rubbed this brass plaque is. This is actually a 19th century Whitehead torpedo. One of the very earliest practical torpedoes in service. There had been some torpedoes in service for about 20 years before, but this is one of the first self-propelled torpedoes that actually meaningfully could have actually done anything more than harbour defence or very, very, very close point defence. And we have ships, wheels, nameplates and more battle honor boards here. Coming into this room, we have a history of submarines in the Royal Canadian Navy. Again, artifacts down below, information boards up above talking about both the subs themselves and the men who served in them. The Royal Canadian Navy's not had that many subs, to be honest, in its, in its history but it's almost continuously managed to have at least one or two in service all the way through to the modern Victoria class. And this section of the exhibit was put together by sailors from the Royal Canadian Navy, so there are a lot of very interesting artifacts, information about escape and invasion, and of course uh, more modern equipment, give you an idea of what it's like <laughs> in a modern submarine. And well, the whole thing is designed to give you some idea of, you know, what you have to mentally prepare yourself for when you're in the underwater section of the na of naval service. And then this room is the most recent of the rooms, uh, the one that's been refitted most recently. So this is all about women in the Navy. And starting off with nurses in the 19th century. Very fetching uniform. My grandmother had, although she wasn't a naval nurse, she did have one of these rather fetching nurses cloaks. Um, I probably should bring those back in my opinion, they're quite cool. And uh, basically describes the contribution of Canada's women to the Royal Canadian Navy through World War I, World War II, various industries, and then getting into the Cold War era, detailing various bases, various specific individuals, 
and how attitudes have changed over the 20th century such that they were able to serve in the Navy uh, without the kind of prejudices that they would have faced in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Coming round to obviously some veterans who continued to serve after their initial service in the Second World War, round to Cold War and then into the modern day. HMCS Cormorant there I believe. Nice little timeline and actually brings us up to within a few years from today. And then coming out of there we find ourselves in the final room that we're going to look at today. This is got lots of nameplates in it which is all to the good but <laughs> it also has many bells and very very sensibly they put them all in glass cases so the likes of me no matter how much tempted we might be can't go ringing them all as well as a rather interesting set here HMCS Iroquois had her bell shattered by enemy gunfire on off of the Korean coast during the Korean War and then pulled into Japan bad luck to have a not have a bell and so they provided plenty of brass casings to the local Japanese firms who produced this Japanese style bell which then re-equipped her thus making her the only ship to have a Japanese style bell in the Canadian Navy as opposed to the more traditional Western style, style bells which you can see behind you or I guess behind the camera. You also got the bell of HMCS Magnificent, one of Canada's aircraft carriers and my particular favourite from this collection as the damage seems to indicate that HMCS Stratford had a small pack of velociraptors on board which um, apparently liked to use the bell as a scratching post considering that most of the other bells remain in fairly good condition and <laughs> even the ones like this one from uh, Mahone uh, they haven't been scratched up quite as much so that is a very quick speed tour of the Naval Museum in Halifax down here as I say on Halifax Naval Base keep an eye out on their website for when they're able to reopen to the general visitors follow the instructions and you can come and have a look at some of the fine artifacts from the Royal Canadian Navy and learn a lot more about what remains a relatively underappreciated service in the wider world but definitely needs a good deal more mentioning so thanks for tuning in to this little tour and uh, see you again another time